as we have had in the last few weeks, yes. I only blame it because they don't have any dessert. <laughs> the news did get out. This is normally they're packing the house. Sorry? This was rescheduled. So, rescheduled, so, yeah. so that's yeah. why people who yeah. were scheduled yeah. one time. And I think they should have broadcast to people who didn't come. Yes, please. I think the topic is more like founder to successful CEO. Yeah. They're still in, uh, I think, like founder stage. Yeah. So this is a smaller like group. But when we did have it advertised, we did have 120 people sign up. So there was some interest in this, but I think like it's rescheduled and it was only sent to the people who scheduled. But nevertheless, we have all the good white people here, so I'm glad, to, happy to see you all. So it's somewhat embarrassing to be giving this topic because we have a few people like Satish Patel and, and other people who have been here, done that more than once. So they'll keep a critical eye on my lessons learned, hopefully. And maybe you'll chime in even, because Satish has done it more than once. So some of you who were not here, anybody here who did not attend the previous couple of talks? No, well, you got a, three, 30, a few people. So my name is Naim Zafar. I'm a, I've been a charter member of Thai Silicon Valley for 16, 17 years. And in addition to being a serial entrepreneur, I am also uh, teach entrepreneurship at UC Berkeley and now professor at uh, Brown University, which is my alma mater, so I go back and forth and every week. And I'm working on my new startup company, Telesense, which is an IoT space, Internet of Things space, in which we do remote monitoring and, and control of things happening around us. So I have <clears throat> gone through this transition a few times, and it's never easy. So I have two parts to this uh, talk. I want to share with you some of the lessons I learned trying to make the transition from a founder to a CEO. And I'm hoping that some of you who have done this may also want to agree, disagree, or chime in or add to that because this is something they never teach you in school. And you have to learn it the hard way. And nobody taught me. So I've made every mistake I'm going to show you today. Uh, my own background is a little bit, I'm an electrical engineer by training. And I've been uh, worked there for 10 years in engineering, 10 years in marketing, then CEO of uh, five different companies. Last one was acquired by Oracle, the new IoT company, we'll see what that does, but it's only one year old. So we're deploying, we got our first order that week, this week. So that's a memorable day, we got the first PL. And uh, <clears throat> so there are a couple of parts. One part is sort of my lessons learned, the second part is my own journey, if that's relevant, depending on how many questions we have, we may not get to the second part, because that's only interesting to a fewer set of people. But basically, uh, the way I look at that, there are five stages you go through from a founder to going to a, a, a CEO. And you start pretty happy, all proud, you're, yay, you know, I'm the CEO. And it doesn't take that long before you become and look like this. <laughs> and this happens sooner than you think. It's, uh, and the question is, what, what, what happens in, in between? What, what does it take you? The fact is, it's one of the hardest jobs you probably will have. It's the hardest job I have had. I'll find myself usually on Friday night on the couch with lights turned off in a fetal position with a beverage at my hand. That was my normal mode for many, many months. And some of you have gone through that can see why. But then, you know, you start being a hunter. You have to hunt. Nobody knows where the customers are or who should care than you do because if you are the founder, you have the passion, you have the understanding, you go through this process. Then most of your life suddenly changes and you're the fundraiser. And fundraising takes every fiber of your body out of you. It's a very consuming process. It's a long process. That's one thing you cannot delegate. And then from that, you're mostly crisis manager because every crisis who cannot be solved ends up on your desk. From there, you have to become the execution meister because it's all about setting the processes in place till you can get this thing done. And finally, a time comes when it's inevitable that transition must take place. 
And there's a lessons to be learned there and how to handle the transition gracefully and correctly. So you go through these five stages of uh, making the transition from founder to CEO. We'll spend time in some of them. So usually, if many of us are in Silicon Valley, we are engineers of some kind. And what are engineers famous for? High IQ, but low EQ, low emotional quotient. This is not the strong suit. Empathy is something I had to look up in Wikipedia. It was not like natural to me. Some people say it's still not natural to me. And you suddenly, you, you, you are set with all kinds of unexpected roles. You're supposed to play the role, and you are in a PhD in you know, internet security, and you started this company, and you're so excited, and you're doing this. But most of your day will not be spending any high-end computing algorithmic stuff. Most of your day will be, mommy, mommy, he stole my pencil. What should I do now? And you're solving those kind of trivial problems because they're urgent, but not important. So normally your real work, when you're good at, starts at 7 p.m. And by the time you go home at midnight, nobody wants to talk to you. So your life changes. This is a choice of a lifestyle which is hard, and people don't understand it. That's why choice of the right life partner is super crucial. You get married to the wrong person, you're pretty screwed. So this is how this whole thing works, is different than people think. So let me show you some of the clarities which I found nobody told you early on. One of the things that you find out as a CEO, that most of the time, you're living in the fog. Living in the fog means you have to make decisions with less than perfect data. Almost never more than 70% of the data necessary to make a good decision, but often as little as 40%. And that's a very dis uncomfortable place to live for many people. People, especially engineers, want to have all the data before they can make a decision. And you don't have, a, you don't have that, you don't have the resources to get the data, you don't have time to get the data. You have to make a decision, half gut, half data, or, and quick. And not, not everybody is comfortable with that. And imagine a lot of people who work for you they may get pretty frustrated because, you know, you're like, boss, what should we do? Well, I don't know. I'm thinking about it. I'll get back to you. And pretty much people say, you know, w w w what's going to happen to this guy? So this, they don't tell you that you will live in the fog. That is, and very occasionally, it clears up. It's like standing on Mount Tamil Pius, and you can clearly see San Francisco. And then it's foggy again. And that's not, that's a strange thing to describe to somebody unless you have lived it. And I've, I mentioned about trivialities. Trivialities will take a lot of your time. You really get to work late when everybody leaves home. During the day, you're pulled and pushed in all directions. Because you don't have the infrastructure, the middle management in place to delegate things to. Because you don't want to disturb. When I was doing it, for example, CEO of my last company, Bitser Mobile, so we were at 25 people in here, and we had like 20 in India. I was the one going to Costco bringing food once a week, because all the software guy was coding. I mean, I can't take my software architect to say, let's go to Costco. I'd much rather have me be coding something useful. Or people are solving customer problems. So you sometimes are the most useless person. And you have to do these things, because everybody else is much more useful. Because suddenly, in CEO thing, other thing you find is, you'll come to a point suddenly one afternoon, I realize I have nothing to do. It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. Because your job is very, you know, when you're fundraising, you're totally consumed. And one afternoon, you have nothing to do. And you feel embarrassed. Like, what should I do? That's when I go to Costco. <laughs> and you'll find out that all the technical degrees you have, most of the problems which will plague you are the founder problem, the people problem. And you didn't learn anything about people when you're getting your PhD in electrical engineering. People are the hardest thing to solve. They're the most complex organism. So a lot of your effort goes to solving people's problems, which you have little training for. But somehow, since we are smart people, we figure out how to deal with these things. Other thing which you may want to also realize, that getting used to new role is difficult. It doesn't really have to do so much about you. It has to do with the positional power. For example, Almost no one will tell you the truth again. People will tell you. They'll say, you know, the things are uh, 
going pretty well. Uh, we are, I think, about 92% of the quota. Uh, are, 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 things are going pretty well in uh, Boston office. We're exceeding quota in San Francisco office. Uh, there's a little bit of problem in, in Bombay and Delhi, but we are fixing it. And Indonesia is doing great. And I think Europe is looking pretty good. I think we're going to have a good year. What did you just hear? There's a big freaking disaster right now happening in Bombay office. You better jump on it immediately. But they, they won't tell you like that. They will mention it. It's like casually hidden between sandwich other news. And if you're not listening carefully, you'll totally miss it. So this happens more often than you think. People will not tell you bad news in your face the way they used to when you were junior marketing manager. You really have to be sharp about listening between the lines and ask clarifying questions. Other thing which hurts even more, that you'll never be liked again. Not quite the same way you used to when you were one of the buddies. I remember uh, my secretary was leaving for a job. We were like 30, 25, 30 people. I kept saying that we got to arrange for a lunch. When should we take you to lunch? You know, when it was the last day. And then one Friday I'm coming, and there are like 14 people leaving for lunch over there. And I, oh, guys, I was organizing the lunch. Where are you guys going? I said, don't worry, we'll be back about 1.30. See you later. <laughs> You're not welcome. I mean, everybody's polite to you, but it really it's not your place. You're invited to all the employees' parties. But trust me, and I know some of you won't, you're expected to leave early. <laughs> because party really starts once you leave. <laughs> and don't say, hey, my buddies, let's hang out. Let's, yeah, like old times. No, there's no old times. When you take that role, your positional power redefines your relationship. And people sometimes don't understand. They linger on too long. But you will never be like the same way. This usually happens when you, once you become a VP, this begins to happen. As CEO, this happens a lot. <coughs> and you feel very bad about it. You feel lonely because this, all these people used to be your friends. But that relationship changes very quickly. And again, if you really want to talk about the issues, you better get a shrink. And it's called a CEO coach. And so you'll be surprised, almost all CEOs have them. And I had them too in two of my startup, and it was worth it. Because your real problems, you cannot really talk to your board. Yeah, they will say you can talk to the board about anything. Not really. You know, to the board, you're like that old-fashioned Navara, those machines, you know, the, <laughs> they only has one handle. You know, slot machines? Yeah. Not the new ones, the old ones. Only had one handle. So board is like that. They only have one handle. When things are never going to mind, they have to replace the CEO. That's the only thing they know how to do. <laughs> So they'll be totally behind you till the day they're not. How do I know? <laughs> More than once. So this is my point is that this is, you, you really, and you can't talk to your VPs and subordinates because sure, they're very polite and they'll be, you know, you're, 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 this has much deeper meaning than your problems. You're, there's nobody you can talk to. You got to pay somebody to listen to you. And of course, you know, you can't talk to your husband or wife because they'll tell you all, all the things you're doing wrong. <laughs> so that doesn't go very pleasantly. So, and don't feel bad. I was, uh, you, know, I, you know, in our industry, I was 20 years in the EDA industry, electronic design automation. The most charismatic CEO, which people still talk about, was Joe Costello. And he was like the king of the industry. So when I found out Joe Costello has a coach, I said, I want a coach. <laughs> So then I had one, and it was, it was very useful. So let me, uh, I mean, I, I have more stuff to go, but let me just pause here for a second in case some of you have comments, questions, concerns. Anybody wants to chime in? Yes, please. So by the time you're talking all these points, you're a reasonably established CEO. Ten plus people. Yes. Can yeah. you go back? Less than ten? Yeah, a little more. Really startup. Yeah. Well, real that, that time, you know, you're, you're CEO, but you only CEO on paper. <laughs> when you're like four, three, four people, uh, yeah, that's, you can just say it looks good to your neighbors, but nobody gives a shit that you're CEO. <laughs> but that's, that's the time when you're most vulnerable also. Is, uh, time vulnerable when you get a board. That's when you're vulnerable. <laughs> and that usually happens after 10 people. So in the beginning, the less than 10 people is more, yeah, you and your co-founders, you're just trying to figure out what to do. But as soon as you raise some money, you know, beyond some angels, and that's where you live in your 10 plus people, that's these things begin to apply. And by the time you're 50 people, they absolutely apply. 
but it's a good question. Yeah. On your uh, CEO. But hold on. Suhas get IRQ1. If you're an electric engineer, he gets the higher priority interrupt. If you're a microprocessor designer. <laughs> okay. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. I was joking On with you. Uh, CEO having a uh, afternoon nothing to do. Yeah. Uh, I read once uh, George Bush saying, like, President is the, during his presidency, he read most books. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then after retiring, <laughs> after presidency. So that shows, like, how sometimes you get free time. Free time, you do, actually. Yeah. You, it happens because you're. You're dealing with usually you know, scenarios which can take all of your time, and suddenly in between crises, you can find that moment. Yeah, you're yeah, absolutely right. Suhas? Yeah, I mean, I, I could relate to everything you put down and put down very, very well. Uh, in the question relating to very early days, yeah. you know, I address that. Okay? So the biggest characteristics of being CEO are the one who is responsible for meeting the payroll. Yeah. Okay? is that it's an extremely lonely position <coughs> by its nature, and you can't do anything about it. You can, even in a small group, you can have all the discussion, but you know, you invariably, in a tough decision making, at that point, you have to take everybody's in, it, but it's not a democratic process, and you have to withdraw and integrate everything in your head, and without 100% knowledge, yeah. you got to make that call. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And in my case, I would tell people, hey guys, it's too confusing. I'll be making the call. Okay? And fortunately, in my team, even they say, okay, well, you do that, then, uh, but we, we will back you up. Yeah. And that's all you want. Yeah. You want people say you should <coughs> be fair, you listen to everybody, yeah. uh, there's no solution pops out just like that, otherwise it have been done already. Yeah. And you make the decision, point the direction, I will take the risk. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I'm going to talk more about that, but you're absolutely correct. That's exactly. The team is looking for you to take a direction. They're willing to back you up, but make a decision, please, because there's some CEOs who just can't. And teams are frustrated because they want to support the CEO. They believe something, but they refuse to make a decision. And that's the frustrating part. So you're absolutely correct. Let me, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Do you have a slide on how to, uh, what is a good coach? I don't have a slide on what's a good coach, but is a good coach is the one, what's a good doctor? The one you connect with emotionally. And which son of, I mean, I, can, I use Brian Franklin, and uh, I recommend him, but there are many. But I think you should meet, just like with a doctor, you don't just show up a doctor and say, sign me up, you meet with them and just with a lawyer. You want to have one or two meetings to see is the chemistry there before you sign them up. So I think the same thing applies here. So, yeah. Just to just comment, if, wouldn't you be meeting customers if you had free time? I mean, wouldn't you be spending more time trying to scope out opportunities versus reading a book or? Well, the customers are not always available for you to just jump on. Suddenly you find 2.30, I got nothing to do. Okay, which customer can I call? Sometimes you can, but the point is that it's not that easy. You know, you, you work on customers' time, not your time frame. Sure. Uh, yeah. Let's say you have a small startup with a founder who's the CEO, mm -hmm. and then they go to a VC for CDC. Uh, when that happens to the VCs, uh, want to observe the founder CEO for a little bit before replacing them, or are there some VCs who want to get experience CEO right away, right when they fund the company? So no, v so question was for the camera, that do VCs, how soon they want to replace the CEO after observing them for some time or right away? See, most VCs, they don't want to replace the, the founder. This is not their job, because that's extra work for them. They want to invest in a team which already kind of know how to work it together. If they have to replace a CEO, things have gone terribly wrong already. No, I, what I meant was not replace them, meaning ask them, ask the CEO to take on a CTO role or something. And That's, so the question is that usually when a good VC will discuss that up front. When I took over Pixis Technology, P.T. Patel had started with two other co-founders, this company, Pixis Technology. The three guys worked together at IBM, came out of IBM. So they knew they were IBM researchers. They had no idea how to build a company. So it was part of Series A conditioning that within one year, we'll replace you, you become the CTO, and we'll bring. So it was all in up and up. And then I was brought in, uh, and I had to, of course, establish the rapport with the company, uh, with the PT Patel and other people. Uh, so short answer is, uh, 
they do want to give you a chance, a good VC, and you want to have a talk about them before you take their money. And they usually will tell you. No, there are bad VCs too who won't tell you. But good VCs will openly have this conversation. And more than VC, you should be insisting on this. Because you want to solve a problem, make some money, change the world. You know, if you're just driven by having this ego and that title, then you're doing it for the wrong reason also. And there are many examples when the right person was brought in. But uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute, too. Let's talk about culture. My favorite definition of culture is how things get done when there is no written rule for it. And the CEO's personality single-handedly defines the culture. And if you read this book, which is, a, I think, a very good read by IBM's uh, CEO, Lou Gerstner, who says elephants cannot dance. And he talks about changing IBM coming from R.J. Reynolds. And it's all about how he dealt with the culture change. Culture was the hardest thing to change. So no matter what kind of a personality do you have, if you come some morning, and you're all like pissed off because you have a fight with your daughter, and you're like angry and like, don't look at me. I want to look at you. Do that sometime. By 11 o'clock, the whole temperature of the office would have come down. People don't know why, but they would be, they'll be sensing it. Something is wrong. Something is tense. You walk in, the three guys are by the water fountain laughing and talking about the weekend and uh, you know, enjoying each other. You just walk by, go into your office, you look at them and they'll frown like, what the hell? And you walked in. You didn't say a word. You just changed the culture of the place. You just said it's not OK to be gathering and collaborating like this. If you had joined the thing and, and made it some comment, something lighthearted, you just changed the culture of the place. So you have to look, not how you feel. You have to look how you want to project. And I sort of wear my emotions on the sleeve. So I made this mistake too many times till I realized that it's not about me. It's about I define the culture. The way I walk in, if I'm positive, relaxed, happy, everybody feels, yeah, good things are happening. Yay, what? Doesn't matter what, what the reality is. So you have to look in control. And again, the how actions you have, if you have, if you have authoritative way to starting the meeting, you're always trying to build consensus, that becomes the culture of the company. Because what happens is people who don't line up with that culture will end up finding it frustrating and leave the company. And people who line up will stay there. So over some time, the whole organization shifts even closer to that norm. So sometimes the only way to solve the culture problem is to replace the CEO. And you see that average life, I heard some place, I don't know how true it is, average uh, tenure of a CEO in Silicon Valley is two and a half years. Seems short. Other thing you should realize is that you cast a much larger shadow than you think. You know, when you were like junior marketing manager, you'd like talk blah, 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 and this and that, and people kind of listen to half the things you said. And you know, did maybe even half what they heard. When you became director and a VP, you know, people listened to you when you spoke. People gave you some chance, and they took you seriously. But something dramatic happens when you become the CEO. Even if you say something which is to you as normal, like you're talking on it in a conference room and say, "God damn it, where are the sales guys?" Which is a normal thing you would say if you were just having a meeting with your coworkers. Suddenly, you leave the room. The whole building is buzzing with, I think, companies going through some disaster. I think CEO is extremely worried. We don't know what's going to happen. Do we have a resume ready? What should we look for? <laughs> you just did that. Because your words are 10 times amplified than you think. What you hear, they don't hear what you hear. So you have to become so careful because you're casting a much larger shadow than you realize. Yes. In the earlier slide, you talked about, you know, should it be authoritative, should it be collaborative? So in your experience, what's the right personality to project as much as it's not easy to change personality? So the question is, what is the right way to act? Is it authoritative, consensus-based? And the answer is, you know, there's no one way. There's no one type of person. There's no one profile of a successful CEO in the world. Steve Jobs is a very different CEO than Warren Buffett or anybody else. I mean, everybody's different in many ways. So there's no right way. And so I, I'm not going to answer that. But I will show you in a couple of slides few attributes which are lessons learned, which I think will address the question you're asking. But Suhas, do you want to make a comment about this shadow problem? 
You know, this I learned uh, a very good point. <coughs> I used to become a CEO, but I, you know, I was appointed head of one of the biggest computer science lab mm. when I was just 27 years old. In MIT? Yes. Mm. Right? I had just, you know, one year after becoming professor. And the first lesson I learned is that I had to talk less, keep my mouth shut. Yep. Because, you know, you otherwise talk too much or discuss more openly, you know, what if and this and that. As soon as you, you possess authority, yeah. you got to be very careful about all the words you speak. Every know. word will count. Everybody will strike people. Yeah. It has yeah. unintended consequences. consequences. Absolutely right. Which is really what you were saying. Yeah. I, I think it's very true. So, so, so yes, sorry. Yeah. So, so sometimes uh, less information is passed is better. Hmm? Sometimes hmm? is the less information passing is much better. No, it's really what it means is, you know, you are accustomed to speaking in a certain <coughs> way. Okay? It is is the diction or, or it is, you essentially are forced to be far more deliberate. Yeah, exactly, that's the word. Than you are accustomed to before. And because you made the transition, and if you have heard this thing, you keep that in mind until <coughs> you learn the art yeah. of how you. You want to communicate the same information, but crisply and carefully worded words. I mean, I'm sort of loosey-goosey, and that gets me in trouble all the time, especially in that position. I don't realize that I'm much taller than I look to myself. <coughs> yeah, in the back, the gentleman with the sports jacket, or jersey, I should say. Come back to the question the yeah. lady just mentioned. If yeah. you think about an engineer founder versus a business founder, are the challenges in front of them as they take on the CEO role? And, and the position that you're taking or the, the wisdom you're sharing here, is that from a particular perspective or these are common challenges? These are that? common challenges. I think they apply to both types of people. You know, obviously it could be magnified because even I could be a technical person, but my challenges could be shared just as much with a business person. I think you, you will make, you will draw your own conclusion from this, some of these remarks. I think, I think they're general. They're not specific to an engineer. But... I'll allow you to, you know. So, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, how much the financial situation or position plays a role in terms of this uh, defining successful CEO versus uh, LVC or CEO? You mean how the, how the results are financial results? Sure, when you're financially successful, all sins are forgotten. No, sometimes, sometimes <laughs> how you can see excessive financial position. So in that case, some of the mistakes can be like accommodated there. Absolutely. Where Just like good looking people get away with so many things. <laughs> Just, you know, yes, well, of course. You can have a free donut. Why not? I can't get away with Jack. <laughs> yeah, I do want to add one comment. Okay? You know, when companies identify and define hard times, okay? they have an inherent weakness of, uh, sort of if everything works out wonderful, wonderful, but you know it doesn't happen. So if there is a failure, it is far more spectacular in, in terms of financial things. Uh, because the team is not kind of geared up to, to kind of stretch it all. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it, forgive. So if you let's say you succeed, but it is not quite yet fundamental. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always a flu collapse and it should be very good. So early success like that. Be careful yeah. because it may not represent the reality. And same thing with raising too much money, for example. You know, again the you never stress, your bad habits develop and then you end up hiding a lot of these mistakes. So let me just uh, share some of the thoughts with you, that funding is one thing which is your CEO's job. That's oxygen. When oxygen runs out, you're dead. So capital is like oxygen. And this is one job you cannot delegate to somebody else. That's your job. 
So don't forget that. No matter what you do, when I actually was hired for CEO of Silicon Design System, so I was trying to do this, change this, change the logo, start this thing. And then the chairman called me one day, you have, you have three jobs. Make sure you keep them in order. I said, sure, let me get my pencil out. Uh, raise money, raise money, and raise money. <laughs> then he said, goodbye. That was the meeting with the chairman of the board. So he realized that you know all these things you're doing, this is your job. People can design logos. Somebody else can do something, but this you cannot delegate. And it was uh, so true. Other thing you realize that who you're going to hire. You know the adage that A players hire A players and B players hire C players. Because their own insecurity prevents them from getting anybody equal to them even. So you, if you don't make a mistake, if you make the mistake of hiring some mediocre people as your first three, four, five, six employees, you're screwed permanently. Because no A player is going to come in and say, I got to work with these guys? Uh, I don't think so. Then you'll end up having a mediocre to a more mediocre organization. It is, if you can learn one thing tonight, is this one. If you're starting a company, be extremely picky of your first half a dozen hires. They will define the culture and set the tone for the rest of the next 25, 30 people. And I made that mistake too. And you need to frequently be asking the question, at least maybe even once a month. When you're having your staff meeting, are these the very best people in the world I can possibly have sitting on this table? <coughs> and if not, why not? And that's the tough thing. It's a tough thing to ask. And if you excuse my French for a second, many people I advise that you may not be asshole enough to be a CEO. It's not the CEO or assholes. They have to ask this question. And that's a tough question to ask. And you may have to fire your friend or somebody you hired because you realize that this is not the very best person. It's not about you and your relationship. Investors and employees have put the trust in you to navigate the ship. So you have to be able to make the tough decisions. And to be able to make the tough decisions, sometimes you have to have the little bit of distance so you can see and not your personal emotions get in the way. And that makes you more alienated and quote unquote disliked. But that is your job. That's the one you signed up for. So you cannot shy away from that. So the news roles also puts new, demands new skills on you. <laughs> so many people used to think, let me put things in two columns. Things you're not supposed to do and things you're supposed to do. Because not supposed to do is your, that's your comfort zone usually. So first thing I used to believe that I have to be a cheerleader. That that's my job. I go, yeah, great job, excellent, doing great. That's the kind of people we need. Yes, team. But I realized after some, taking some hard knocks, that's not your job. Your job is to say no. I know it may come somewhat annoying and shocking to most of you. It is your job to say no. People are expecting you to say no half the time, but they don't want to say no because they want to send it upstairs till you say no. You have to chisel away. You have to reject things. You have to say no to product feature creep. You have to say no to other people want to do this. They want to open an office there, do something like, no, we're just doing this. If you're a pilot, you realize that every plane, given you have a finite number of 7,000 feet of runway, so a plane cannot be more than 3,000 pounds. Otherwise, you will not be able to take off because you have finite runway and some headwinds. So you have to throw things off the plane to allow it to be in takeoff weight. And it's your job to throw things off the plane so you achieve the takeoff. And this is not obvious. It's not, it's not being cheerleader. It's your job is to say no. Second thing is, you want to get involved with everything. You want to be on top of things. You want to see what's happening in engineering and sales. And first time CEOs want to do that all the time. Then you realize after some time, you're spending all your time just doing getting involved. And you're not really doing what you're supposed to be doing. And what you're supposed to be doing is define a clear direction. It's not VP of marketing's job to define a clear direction. It's not VP of sales job. It's not your CFO's job. It's your job. You're listening to all those people. You have defined a clear direction. Allow people to now help you get there. They will jump if you have hired the right people. They'll jump up to help you get there. But unless you haven't defined the direction clearly, they don't know where to jump or how high to jump. 
That's precisely your job. Other thing I used to think was that, you know, if you can't measure it, that's BS. Everything has to be measurable. And the fact is that you have to set, that's true, you have to be able to set specific goals with metrics as measured by. So if you have specific goals set, which are measurable and quantitative, and you have a clear direction, then you have done your job. You can get out of the way and let people accelerate. Don't trip on, let them trip on each other. Then you also believe some people, and it's a question you're asking, do we running a democracy? Are we making sure all of us are deciding? And the answer is absolutely not. You don't have time to run a democracy. What you're supposed to do is drive consensus. And drive consensus is different than running a democracy. Ultimately, you have the ability and the responsibility to make the final decision. And you want to hear from people. Once people feel heard, they're much more likely to go along with the direction, even if they not fully agree with it. But if they don't feel heard, they will continue to fight it. So sometimes, and this is your job, this is nobody's job but the CEO's job, and sometimes I've done that, I've gotten people in the room and said, tell your husband and wives you're not coming home till we resolve this thing. We're starting the meeting at 2 p.m. and gonna be here till we can make this decision. And I found very surprisingly that after about 1 a.m., even the strongest opponents begin to melt. And that's driving consensus is your, your job. This is how you get things done. And some people will not agree. And I've told one VP of sales was ready to quit. But I told him that, Mike, I need you. I want you in this thing, but we're going left. That's, we're not going to do this thing. It does not make strategic sense. And these are my reasons. So I heard his reason. I told him my reason. Decision was finally clear. And when you have a clear decision, you'll be surprised how many people will jump on the ship along with you. They want to support you. Then again, I used to believe that you do what you do best. If I'm an engineer, I was an electrical engineer, I should be helping the engineering team as much as I can. I was also good at marketing, let me do that. Answer is no. That's when you were a hardware engineer, you were good at engineering, not now. Now you need to make the only decision only a CEO can make. Your job is to make those decisions which other people cannot make. So this is a different job and you Almost nobody gave you the recipe how to do it. So these are the hard lessons one has to learn as you realize the job is different and you have to make decisions in a way only you can make and most of the time the answer will be no. Then again, last thing is try hard and rationalize failure. But fact is you have to be brutally honest. And if you're not brutally honest with yourself and your team, then you will lose the respect. You have the license to be brutally honest. You can say that as you saw it, what we did wrong, what are we going to do differently? If you don't admit it, then you cannot fix it. By admitting it to yourself and to your team, you open the possibility of people to now come up with solutions. So these are some hard lessons which all of us had to learn the hard way. I uh, want to talk about the board, but before I go to the board, any, any comments or question on this one? Yes. So first comment is you <coughs> talked about A people hire A people. Yeah. Problem is the money. So yeah. We know that there are people, you know, there are really top grade people. We know who should be here, but they are too expensive to hire. So question is, what do we do to get top notch talent? You don't always have top notch money. So how do you solve that problem? So you're absolutely right. Some people who are really mercenaries and very good are very expensive. I've heard numbers which I can have trouble believing that top talent software people today, T comp, total compensation, two million. I just cannot believe it, but I'm told by more than one person that is true. So those people you're not gonna be able to hire. But I've found in my 25 years in the Valley that people are driven not just by money. Ask yourself, would you be driven and take the job with the most money even if you had no passion for it? And most of us, if you really ask them that, no, I wouldn't do it. People are, your currency as the founder is your passion, your vision, and your stock option. Use all three. 
And you'll be surprised the right people will want to follow you and can line up to this, and that's the kind of person you want to bring on. If they all talk about money, that's not the right person at that stage. Let Google go after him. So I, I know I'm running out of... Uh, Your top five, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're at number three. Second, of, yeah. second comment on the earlier slide is that it says that CEO shouldn't be doing everything. Yeah. But there are a lot of things that there is nobody assigned to. So yeah. we kind of end up doing it because so, you know, we are kind of fall back. But exactly. So going to Costco was my example. You know, I had to go because nobody really was coding. So, but... Can a delegate going to Costco, can a delegate raising funding to Costco? Or to some assistant? Or to even to Taskmaster, TaskRabbit? Fact is, there are other alternatives to most of the things I used to spend trivial times on. They were alternatives. But I was just like, either too cheap or you know, just too motivated to want to do it myself. So what I was teaching myself was, uh, after making all those mistakes and paying the price for them, that I was wrong. I should have spent the money on some temporary help, you know, one day a week even, an office manager to come in and do those things. I was wrong trying to do all those things. I was being penny-wise, pound-foolish. So I'm sharing with you, don't be th that way. You are a CEO, you have raised some money, use the money wisely. Don't be so cheap that you hurt yourself, and I did hurt myself. And not just hurt myself, you, then even in front of my board I looked bad because I'm... If I have time to go to Costco and do all those things, maybe what am I not doing? So I did that image changes. So once I remember in one company, I was so frustrated because the fridge was so dirty, nobody would clean it. And so I found myself one of those 3.30, I had nothing to do till 5 o'clock. So I went and started cleaning it myself. I was trying to set an example for the CEOs to clean the fridge. Anybody can clean the fridge. But it backfired. The rumor was, looks like I got nothing going on, nothing to do. No customer is, is cleaning the fridge. Yeah, <laughs> sounds about right. So you have to be careful. Because I was trying to do something good and set an example. I, it backfired. I sent the wrong message. OK. So a board, yeah, let's talk about the board. So board is one of your complicated relationships. The previous question yeah. about CEOs, suppose there's a conflict between the employees. Yeah. How, how to solve And if you cannot solve, what should we do? So the question is, if there are conflict between the employees and you, you can't solve it, what should you do? Well, if you fire one of them, maybe most likely the one answer. But the answer is, you, you know, it's a complicated question because there are so many nuances to it. You know, what, what, what is the conflict coming from? Can they be removed? You, I, if I could not solve it in one hour, I'll try to delegate that to somebody to solve it, either the manager or an outside person. Because people problems are complicated. You have to hear both sides out and figure out what strategy the company needs or doesn't need, and how can you make it work. So a simple can answer cannot be given, except my rule was I need to hear them out. If I cannot solve it in one hour, I'm finding somebody other than myself who's above my pay grade who can do it. And I had outside HR people who will come in and do those things. But what you cannot do is totally give up everything and embroil yourself solving people problem, because board did not hire you to do that. What board hired you to do was to execute. So what I learned with board was that you have to <clears throat> learn to communicate outside the board meeting. You can't just wait for the board meeting and spring news on them. And board meetings are very strange. One misplaced comment can totally drive the direction of the board direction in a completely random way. And I've seen too many times, one comment, and suddenly the whole board is talking about this for like half an hour. And some decisions are being made very casually. So you have to control the communication. You have to control the meeting. So my, what I, what my advice is any bad news, you have to deliver before the board meeting and in person. Board meeting should be delivered the remaining good news. Don't you know, necessarily waste your good news. And so even once, for example, in 2001 crash, when all the companies were falling apart, a lot of smart people were available. So I wanted to make sure that we were doing the fingerprint sensor company, where did it come? So we wanted to look like we are moving forward, biometric security is still needed. So I took like um, six or five or six people who are like unemployed people, Thai members, and I said, guys, why don't you, you know, just uh, give me 10 hours of your time, you can come into the office. 
your wife will feel like you're doing something useful and you know, will we'll volunteer. But I put a press release out saying that Veredicam hires five new VPs moving forward because I was not paying them anything. This was all not even stock options. It was more optical, as we call it. But my boards, at that time, the company was owned by Korean investors. By the time news got to Korea, the whole board was furious. They said, you mean you hired five VPs? We were never told how much money are we spending? And the trust was broken. And the trust never came back. I had to resign maybe six months later for other reasons because you know, this, there were other hanky-panky going on Korean style, but that's a separate situation. But nevertheless, point is the trust was broken. So I learned a very important lesson that you, earning the, and keeping the trust of the board is very critical. Other thing which I realized was that the things you communicate with the board go into three buckets. The first bucket is all the things you, you're informing the board, FYI. About 70% of the things fall in this bucket. The second bucket is things you want to present to the board and ask their input before you will make the decision. So something like hiring a vice president, that can fall into this category. Or maybe starting a new initiative in a new business direction falls into that category. About 15% of the things fall in that bucket, 15, 20%. And the third bucket is things you want to present to the board so that board can make the decision. That's not your decision to make. And only about 5% of the things fall in this bucket. This will be like raising more money, M&A, merger or acquisition, sale of stock. So the first time CEOs confuse all three. They don't separate the bucket. And they're going to like board, board, uh, I'm, can I spend this uh, $10,000 on this uh, Gartner, please? Or they won't quite say that, obviously, but they'll say almost like that. And pretty soon, board is going to say, why are we paying this guy all that money? I mean, we have to decide all these things. They're not going to say, oh, you decide. They will decide because they're all ex-CEOs. They want to get in the, into the middle of the game anytime they get a chance. So managing your board and sort of drawing the line that what decision you want them to make is not easy but necessary. What things? FYI. What is it? Oh, first bucket things? No, no, you, you know, they're, they're usually business update, how it's happening in sales. So normally what my boards always insisted that send us the slide you're going to present at least a day before or 48 hours before. So they can scan them. They have some questions. They come prepared. So, and then you present the slide, and they'll have lots of questions. So yeah, the, most of those things are part of the slide set. But I think the point I'm making is that sometimes if, if you don't let them, they will start telling you how to run the company. And a smart CEO, a strong CEO, will sort of draw the line in some polite way, say, you know, I got those things covered. Allow me to, let's wait our discussion of the executive session because I need your input and blah, blah. So you're sending it in a, in a clear way that got it. But it's a tricky situation. I mean, board, depending on who's on the board, it's not easy. And I know some of you have dealt with boards. Anybody else wants to add to the board dynamics, because I, I'm sure all of you have something to say about this. We've dealt with boards for a long time. It is, it is trickier than you think. <laughs> uh, so like I mentioned, you have to separate what's important from what's urgent. It's very easy to get dragged into things which are in, urgent when, for example, I used to spend a lot of time just keeping current on my emails. And I realized I'm spending about three to four hours a day on email. So I started basically making it part of my email signature. They're checking email at 11 AM and 5 PM. Just made it part of my email signature. That I figured, and I really used to then get Exit Outlook, because if you don't exit, things keep popping up. You need blocks of time to do meaningful stuff. You need blocks of time to get things done if you have to do some research, write a report, prepare a presentation, because you get so interrupt-driven 
that you're looking, popping, you know, unless you're an 18-year-old when this is normal way of living, for most normal people like our age, this is not a normal way of living. You need concentration time to get things done. So think about how you're going to separate the two. My advice to you is if you're a CEO, about one day a month, it'll be very smart for you to leave the office, leave your cell phone behind, and spend just taking a walk and thinking, are you doing the right thing? This time alone, without anybody to talk to, without any electronic noise, is very essential. Because otherwise, you'll be constantly busy. There'll be no time you won't be busy, but doesn't mean you're doing the right thing and spending in the right energy in the right places. And nobody is going to ask you but yourself. So to me, as a role of a CEO, this one day off is quite essential. The other thing which I'm a big believer in, creating emotional ownership. What I learned very soon was when you start to divide tasks, say, hey, Julie and Jim, why don't you take care of the Christmas party? All right, well said. No. Julie's looking at Jim. Jim is looking at Julie. Okay, you do it. Because you have just split the responsibility. If you, when people have a singular emotional ownership to get something done, I found that they always jump higher. But when you divide it up among multiple people, or don't clearly give them and say, you say, okay, come up with some ideas. I'll decide what we're going to do for the Christmas party. You haven't given the emotional ownership. And whenever I've decided to give the full emotional ownership, I've found people have jumped higher. So I'm a big believer of this, that you should decide and make people completely emotional ownership. When it's their project, they can feel it, and you're relying on them, they will deliver more than you expected. Great, great wisdom. Did you think about this? Did a lot of this come to you as you were senior exec in, in your world prior to becoming a CEO, or you sort of had to fall into the role for all of this to, to hit you? It's hard to know because, you know, the question is that this has all come to me once I became a CEO or was I somehow seeing this as I was moving through my career as a VP and director. I think a lot of that was through observation, but a lot of that really doesn't, it doesn't hit you till you're in that seat. It hits you, slaps you across the face when it sits in the seat. It's a very different feeling. And it's a, it's a lonely feeling, it's a hard feeling, it's a responsibility on your shoulder feeling. So even if I was absorbing it, it did not hit me the way it, sh it did hit me once you take the job. So the essential skills I think you have to develop, one is the clarity of thought. And this was, uh, so I mentioned this earlier, your, each word now carries 10 times the weight it used to. So you have to think clearly and able to articulate those things clearly without too many words. More words you say are subject to cause more confusion. You have to learn to be deliberate and do the, just the right. And if, you, if you're using too many words to express a thought, you don't have clarity of mind. So clarity of mind is one essential thing. Well, of course, we all know that networking is important because there are very few things you do by yourself. You have to develop the networking skills, communication skills, and selling skills. So all those four skills are very essential to any CEO. And these are not the things you normally would study or be good at before you got there necessarily depending if you were just thrust into from founder to CEO position. If you came through the ranks in a big company, then you probably have. But a typical smart person got her PhD, starting a company, and suddenly she's got to do with all this thing. Nobody taught her those things. She's very smart. So th that's what you have to do. Then when you get to the crisis manager thing, <clears throat> yeah, please. Visualization. You know, it means uh, you know, by the way, Steve Jobs had it very, very good. The, the, the need, the skill, you have talked about different things to do, but visualize how things are going to go uh, in the market, in the world, and then where will the company be, what its role will be. It is, it is the job of the CEO, and if CEO is also part of the job. The job of strategically looking ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah. Visual. I mean, it is yeah. visualization means to absolutely to develop a feeling or understanding yeah. of where this company is relative to the world, okay? and it is not strategic planning as done by the marketing. Right. So I think if I can just uh, say that for the camera. All these things, but you're picking up data point, but your job is to see where the puck will be. And it's, it, it's your competition is skating too, where the industry trends are skating too, and where company is capable of. All these things in your mind have to be able to see how you can take advantage of that. And that's nobody's job but the CEO's job. You, you cannot delegate that part. And you need to have a visceral feel, and Steve Jobs is often mentioned because he had a visceral feel of a lot of these things in, in his mind. Not all CEOs would have it. But you realize that is a job which you are expected to do. So another thing is about communication. So there will be crises. There will be crises all the time. The wrong thing to do when the crisis is to shut down communication because we don't want to disturb everybody. Let's just tell everybody everything is fine. We'll keep working. No. People would know. People would know how you walk through the door. You're better off over communicating and telling people so there's not much time is wasted. Otherwise, a lot of time is wasted. People will assume the much worse case scenario than you think there is. So when we had the situation when our Veridicom, the fingerprint company, our Series D collapsed, and board told us to lay off everybody, we kept 17 people behind. But then every day, 11 o'clock, me and uh, Mike Damore was a CEO, I was the VP of Marketing and Sales. We will have a meeting every day, 11 o'clock, and we'll sit there and answer as many questions anybody has till people have no more questions. There's nothing to gossip about. We have answered all the questions. We'll sit there with you and not give up. That kind of openness allowed me to keep the seven people loyally there for six months. In six months, I was able to sell some assets, sell some patents, raise $7 million, and restart the company. But if I had lost them, there will be nothing. So this idea that listen, gather information, over-communicate if necessary is important, but always look in control, even if you don't feel like it, and you won't most of the time. But when you look flabbergasted and out of control, suddenly the whole company's emotional frame of mind will come down. When you look confident in control, everybody will feel like energized, and yeah, yay. Try that sometime. It's amazing how that works. It just still baffles me. <clears throat> so leadership. What is leadership? So leadership is that complex topic. Many books have been written about this. I said it's not, of course, it's not about pleasing everybody. It's about doing the right thing for the right reasons and taking people where they may not want to go. Which means showing them a vision which they can believe in. Show them a person they can trust and willing to follow them to the get person. Now, a leader does not have to be the CEO, and often is not. But if the CEO is the leader, that's a good combination. Because that person has the positional authority and responsibility to take you, and has the right wherewithal that you're willing to go there. And again, don't forget to say no. It is your job to say no. So then, <clears throat> once you get to some scale, now the startup CEO thing is behind you, you are moving forward. Now you have to think about sitting processes in place. When processes can replace your own vision, passion, and ability to overcome all these things. You're not going to scale by you doing all the hard lifting. You're not going to scale even if you have some gladiators who can go and get the sales orders done. You have to scale an organization. So that requires a different skill. That requires a different thought process. And then, you remember, you may have been very frugal in the early days. Now time to be smart, not being so frugal all the time. I had always trouble with this thing. I've, you know, when you grew up in depression, you, like, you never spend money again. You know, your grandparents, for example. It's kind of like that. I've been through so much hard time in the nuclear winter of 2000 that even when we were scaling, I was willing to not willing to spend money. I was suspiciously frugal, which was also not good. Not willing to hire any middle management, and I couldn't scale. So you have to make the switch. There was a time for frugality, and there was time for scaling. 
and you have to invest to be able to scale. And one thing I was listening to, uh, actually, Scott McNeely, who took uh, Sun Microsystem from very beginning to multi-billion dollar company, and uh, somebody asked him the question that, what was the biggest mistake you made? Guess what he said? The worst mistake I made was building all the real estate. So I should have just rented. Because when times are good, when times are bad, it's cheap. You just rent it. When times are good, it's expensive, but then your times are good, so you're making money. So it doesn't matter. He said, biggest mistake was all the buildings he built. That's fixed cost, like a noose around your neck, and that really bogs you down. So I thought it was quite interesting. So you also should know the timing. Timing changes in a company. When a company goes from startup to having the first product, to the first you know, few million in sales and finally scale, the power base changes. In the very beginning, all the power and control is with engineering. Because if you don't have, if you can make the stuff, it's, it's not going to be able to, nobody's going to be able to you know, sell anything. That's where the power lies. But once you can figure out how to start selling, the power goes to sales. Can you sell anything at all? VP of sales is like the most powerful person in the company. And the time will come, then you can sell to anybody. We know that we can sell, but who should we sell to? This is when VP of marketing will have power, albeit briefly. But yes, there will be a time when VP of marketing will have some power. And when you get to like $100 million mark, then it's the CFO who will have the power. It's all about operationalization, and it's about saving money and cost effectiveness. So power shifts. So you have to think about what stage are you at, and do you have the most competent person in that position? Because there's something else which I, you learn by doing it. It's not so obvious, but obvious once you see it, but it's not obvious when I was doing it. So, and then time comes when it is time for you to make the transition. You have outlived your usefulness as the founding CEO. What most people tend to do is fight it, make a big stink about it. And that's really bad. In, it's in poor taste. You may no longer be the CEO, but you'll always be the founder. So that's a title you should wear gracefully and wear it well. They cannot take that away from you. So a smart thing will be to plan for it. My, with my college roommate, Ashar Aziz, was doing FireEye. He started as a solo founder, actually, in 2006. And he kept telling me throughout that a time is coming when I need to find a real CEO. They looked for the CEO for two years before they hired Dave, and then Dave took them public in 2013. So he did it right. He looked for it. He worked with Pramod Huck of Norwest and Sequoia, who were his two VCs, to find the right person. They went through like 20 people, and they found the person who did a very good job. This, the, the Dave was the CEO of uh, McAfee before Intel acquired them. And he took the company public, and the company is sitting at like, I don't know, five, to five billion plus valuation. But he planned it, and because of that, he was able to retain title of vice chairman, chief strategy officer, and head of products. And if he had fought it, he insisted he should be the CEO. He was the CEO for five or six years, but then time came, and he, he did it well. And finally, I think you should think about, uh, you know, you've got to wear it well. It's beyond the title. They can always be with you when you did something useful and became successful. So people forget is also the control is not the same as ownership. I remember Rajiv Madhavan, a friend of mine, when he was, uh, got kicked out of Ambit, you know, he was like nasty, nasty for a like, long time. It would be hard to have lunch with him. He was pissed off at VCs, he was pissed off at everybody, but then... Two years later, when Prakash Bolero sold the company, he got a check for $21 million. So don't forget that your ownership is different than control. You may lose control, but you're still a shareholder. And shareholder has its own obligation and rewards. So control does not come from ownership necessarily. Control comes from a whole bunch of other provisions. And then all ideas which you have are, have to be chiseled away before they improve. What's the difference between a slab of marble and a good-looking statue? It's the same slab of marble, except some extra marble has been chiseled away. So all ideas are the same way. If you are a CEO, you're making all the decision, 
like a North Korean general, it's highly unlikely they'll be all be good decisions. So gi giving a permission for your team member to chisel and question those decisions will allow you to make better decisions. But if you don't allow people to chisel at your ideas and decisions, it'll be just look as pretty as the slab of marble. So think about that. And again, the concept of vesting is important to understand, even for co-founders. I've seen that movie too many times. Three people start the company. They each have 33% stock, not option. They bought the stock. And then one guy falls in love with some girl and disappears to you know, Paris. And the other two founders are still slaving away. You just, a bunch of equity just walked away. So vesting is how you make sure, even for founders, there's a company has a right of purchase so that you can, if somebody leaves, you can still get some stock back and not be outside. So some of these things people forget. But finally, I want to share with you something about perspective. You know, a lot of people become a CEO, they become all excited, they start acting with their ego and everything gets in the way. Hey guys, yes, you're not the king. It's a Burger King hat. <laughs> you know, you, you were the same person you were last week or the month before. So you keep your, those egos in check because it's a job you're doing. You have obligation. You're not king of the world. You know, earn that until you get there. So perspective is important to keep. And uh, so let me stop here because my rest of my slides are more about my personal history and talking about my own lessons learned and what I went through, which may or may not be relevant depending on what time it is and when you want to go home. We can, this is a good stopping point also possibly. So any questions I can answer, yeah. So uh, when the CEO transitions is, uh, in, in terms of company, is that when the control passes from engineering to sales or even further out? Well, CEO's, CEO is always there. So the control within his or, or her organization shifts. Who is the most important person on the table? Is it the secretary of the state or the secretary of treasury? You were talking about the CEO transition um, from like the founder to somebody else. So when that typically happens? So when does it typically happen? Uh, so there's, uh, I don't know about typically, but typically it happens when things are going extremely well or when the things are going terribly bad. So it's usually one of those scenarios. So there's no one standard way. Uh, yes, the lady there. Continuing that question, is it usually better for the CEO to say, OK, I feel like I've contributed what I have and I don't have the skill set to go further? Or is it the job of the chairman of the board to say, look, it's time? Well, it's not the chairman of the board. It's, it's the board, all of the board members. The chairman may be chosen to communicate that. So in an in ideal world, uh, it should be mutual. And CEO will say that you know, it's, uh, we think, as a shareholder, I would be feel better if a smarter guy, like Ashur Aziz, the example I gave you, he said that. He said, you know, I'm a good engineer. I've built this product. As a CEO, I've gotten it to like 10, 20 million in sales. But taking it to 100 million in sales and a billion and taking IPO, that's not my strong suit. There are people who have done that, who can do that. I want my 10 million shares to be worth a lot of money. So I'll be well served getting somebody else. And he knew the, how hard the job was. So in this case, the founder was smart and was able to know that his, what is his objective in life? Is his objective in life is to be CEO of a publicly traded company or make enough money that he can pursue some of the passions he really wanted to pursue? And it was clear to him, and he made the right choice. But that kind of right choice is very hard because your ego get in the way, gets in the way. And most CEOs are very hard for them to say that it's time for me to go and mostly somebody has to tap on the shoulder. That's like 90% of the time it happens that way. So Has, would you agree or what's your opinion? Yeah, actually, this is very complicated. Uh, but let me shed some light, OK? Uh, the VCs have a tendency to bring quote unquote either somebody very professional or they say no professional is with some professional experience. And yeah, that's what they call a professional CEO, whatever that means. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if it is not a very, I mean, if, if VCs are not very experienced and, uh, you know, the very good quality VC, 
They will not do the work, they will not involve you enough okay, to find absolutely the right person. So even after you agree that maybe it's a smart idea because you can raise money or whatever you face. So professional, so unquote professional CEOs can also spell death of the company. And it has happened not only for little companies, billion dollar companies too. Right? <coughs> and so this art is, is a little bit of art, a little bit of love, and so on. Yeah, okay? yeah. Now, there is another element which is so very important. Some companies are in a field that grows slowly. It will take time. Under those circumstances, the founder, CEO, helped by coach, which could be VC or otherwise, okay, actually is able to uh, you know, continue to be CEO and grow if there's enough time to grow. Either Steve Jobs himself fell into that category so also and Mark Zuckerberg and some of these people because A, they had enough of the control of the shares and B... Yeah, that's a separate factor. Now, yeah. when the field is such that you know, it's a whole bunch of people are trying, they're like Lucas, and somebody's idea actually has the element and uh, gets traction. Traction <coughs> leads to money. At that point, if it's a young person, there is no way that a young person is going to, no matter how smart, is going to go through these phases and learn fast enough. And so the chance of, of the thing falling apart is very high. And at that time, you have no choice but to bring in you know, somebody who has already been through the, in the process to, to, that is compatible and takes over. So this business of when should a transition occur is highly specific to the particular situation of the company, the technology, the dynamics, the time frame, yeah. amount of money necessary. Okay? And uh, you know, now you have very good examples of like Oracle. You know, uh, Larry also owns a large percentage of the company. And somebody says, oh, that gosh, it's bad. I think in, in part, the success of Oracle is, firstly, he's quite, quite good, but Oracle could not have done what it did, you know, if it had, it didn't have a situation where a strong, well-capable person owned enough to be able to give leadership to, to that company. So, it, 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 you know, without looking at specific, it's very hard to say what is the right, you know, um, path for the company. So, benefit of such, you know, by the way, I like your presentation, very, okay? You learn through this, and until you start developing a sense of feeling, and, you know, so you become capable of kind of, uh, navigating this field. That's the best you can do. Then everything depends on sensibility of that particular situation. And hopefully, your partners also have that sensibility. Then good things happen. Okay. Otherwise, even a good idea falls apart. Yeah. It's a navigator is the word. There's so many glaciers and so many sharks. You have to learn to navigate, and you don't know the whole map. You got to compute on the real time on the spot. So that's why it's you need the team, you need the perspective. So I think the point that Suhas made is excellent. I want to add to that that sometime a smart CEO will bring quickly very strong people around them. I know Rajiv Madhavan was running his last company, Magma. He, in his executive staff, he had I think at one point I counted seven people who had held CEO titles not working for him as VP of sales, VP of marketing, VP of this. That was his ability to collect that kind of a talent. So then he was able to survive. Well, he was good too, but he sur he's surrounded with so much talent. That is another way. So should I spend 10 minutes on some of my own history or lessons? Or? Yes, please. Okay. 
So, you know, I was born uh, in Pakistan. And again, one of the tricks which I call myself is that I was went to a mediocre school. We were lower middle class family, Urdu medium, not English medium, not those rich kids who go to those fancy schools with runs by nuns. And but my thing was because I was at school and to support myself, I was tutoring other kids same age as me. In ninth grade, I was teaching other people. Tenth grade, I was teaching tenth grade physics and whatnot. And that allowed nothing clarifies concepts in your head when you explain to other people. So this was the trick how it allowed me to top uh, in the board exams in metric and FSC, and came to this country with three hundred dollars in my pocket at Brown University as a goofy undergraduate. Yeah. Uh, I want to know about that snowman. Yeah, that's the picture I took, actually. Uh, the North, okay. Northern Pakistan. No, no, it's further up. So this is uh, Mount Hindu Kush. And uh, uh, so if you go to Northern Pakistan, before you reach the Chinese border, you go through all this. I was there in 2005. So then I ended up in this place. And this was my alma mater, the, one of the Ivy League schools, smaller schools in, uh, close to Boston in Providence, Rhode Island. And from there, I too used to look good. <laughs> and it's hard to believe. Sometimes I show this to my students and say, this can happen to you. <laughs> Be worried. It was the same thing. I came here in full scholarship. But again, I was tutoring other kids within a year. And that's how I made my money. And that's how I really understood the concept. So that was, to me, is an excellent way. Struggling, but tutoring puts you on top. My first job was working for a large company designing electronic systems, actually the vision control system, which is today used in autonomous vehicle. I was doing the collision avoidance system back in the early 80s. It took about 20 years for it to become mainstream. So it was all the collision avoidance with sensors like you see in your cars, which beeps and bongs when you get too close. And, but basically, I was so raw, you know, coming into this thing. And this was, to me, was essential to work for a large company because I learned how to behave in a professional environment. You know, I will be so cocky, I'll just, in a room of 200, I'll get up and say, and I did, told the VP how his slides were incorrect, and that makes no sense. You know, so I had to be, like, tamed down in three or four years I spent there, how to talk to people, how to present, how to manage the sensitivity in an organization which exists. It was a very good learning experience. Till I started my first job doing all these things, uh, chip design, and also got a master's degree. And then nobody, I interviewed there in, the, in Minnesota in, in, the, in the summertime. It looked pretty nice. When I showed up for January, it was minus 32 or something. It was just absolutely frozen. It was difficult and hard to learn how to get there. But I did start my first company when I was 26. Four of us got together. And we realized that we were chip designers, but we did not have a decent tools. So our first machine was a hardware accelerator. But I have to admit, I have to be embarrassingly admit with you guys, I didn't start this company to make a lot of money. I didn't start this company to change the world. I started this company because to, this was the fastest way to be a VP of something. <laughs> that was my main motivation. I couldn't be more excited. I was handing out my business card to anybody on the street. It was so stupid. But you know that when you're 26, that looks like the biggest thing in the world. But anyway, uh, after three years, we sold the company, and you would recognize to Prabhu Goyal. So the Prabhu did this uh, before Prabhu was acquired by Cadence. He was a company called Gateway. They acquired the assets of this company. It was a great learning experience, a lot of lessons learned, and I was the VP of engineering. And then I came to Silicon Valley in 88 and joined this company called Quick Turn Design System, 10 people, and we were making the world's first emulation system. And this was, I went from a senior hard, so from VP of marketing, uh, uh, engineering, I was back to being a senior hardware engineer. So then I started again that whole process of from engineering, making the switch to marketing. And I was there for 11 years. and. I think I eventually designed the system, and the company took pu went public in 93 and was acquired by Cadence in a hostile takeover bid in 99. But we grew the company to 400 people, 100, what about 150 million in sales, 96 patents, a lot of patent lawsuit. But it was a great journey for me, because as a goofy engineer to technical marketing manager all the way to VP of marketing, and then I joined this company called Veridicom, making fingerprint sensors. 
So founder of QuickTurn had become the CEO of this company, and he wanted somebody he knew and can trust. So I was pulled in. So the hardest thing was to get your first CEO job. And any of you who have tried to be a CEO, unless you start your own company, it's not easy. You have to jump so many hoops. You have to satisfy all board members and a bunch of other people in the company, and it's, it's not easy. But uh, fortunately, when the company went through this crisis, when we Series D, we lost, they said, lay off everybody. I hung around, and I was part of that restarting the company. So this was the 17 people who stu stood with us, which because of over-communication, we kept them back. And I was able to sell the assets, sell the patents, sell a copy of the algorithms, raise $7 million, restarted. So I ended up doing that. So I then became, a, from that, I actually became the CEO because the company was so broken, and the money I raised finally was from Korean investors. And you know, nobody, no real professional CEO will touch this company. In a market like 2001 when nobody's buying anything, we have these biometric fingerprint sensors with the Korean investors and hardly any money and 17 people who survived the nuclear winter. Yes, name is the CEO. But that was my game plan was just get the title anyway, any broken company. Once you have had two years on your resume, then other things can happen. And that's exactly what I did. I resurrected the company I mentioned and finally from Korean investor became the president and CEO. Actually, I became the president and CEO the day of 9-11 happened. I was having my first off-site meeting during 9-11. So that was a terrible way to start. But I learned that, and uh, they ran out of money, a bunch of bad things happened there. But I was able to land, park the car. I was able to sell the company to a public shell called Alpha, Alpha Virtual, and it became a publicly traded company. Stock was traded at $6 for some time. Koreans got the money out. I was able to get out in a proper way. But that gave me enough credentials that this Israeli company was trying to change itself from an ASIC design services company to an EDA software company. Now I had done the CEO gig for a couple of years. So this was not a Silicon Valley normal company. This company was 40 people in Israel, in Jerusalem, and seven or eight people in Silicon Valley. But that was the next step up for me. So it was a great lesson in being bi-coastal. I was flying to Israel every week how to manage teams there, how to manage teams here, how to manage the board. I raised $10 million for them, and I really learned to raise money for the first time with my own hands, not by selling assets, but going to VCs, and especially Israeli VCs. So my point here is that there is a lesson to be learned by slowly chiseling away and honing your skills. You practice on this junior league before you come back to the senior leagues. So this was a company which was funded by Silicon Valley VCs, Pixis Technology, this is where I replaced the three IBM founders, P.T. Patel. The only negative was the company was in Austin. And their, their juicy point was, well, you're commuting to Jerusalem, Austin is much closer. <laughs> and my wife thought that was a correct statement, so I ended up taking this job, raised money for them. But then again, here we had an internal coup d'etat. And why it happened? Because I overplayed my hand, I was company was still not getting sales done. This IBM guys was great for designing tools which work for IBM, but take this technology out of IBM and try to apply to all chips, not easy. <laughs> Much harder than it even looked. And it became and the mistake I learned here was I asked one of my board members, Joe Hutt, who was was from IBM, used to work with those guys, the three guys, that Joe, you retired. He was a VP of engineering at Magma. I said, why don't you come help me out, be my VP of engineering? And he, he was retired, he was kind of bored. He said, sure, I'll do that for a while. So he moved to Austin. So check this out. CEO is here in Silicon Valley, commuting every other week to Austin. A board member becomes VP of engineering. He's living there in the company. The power dynamics completely shifted. You take a guy who's a board member, supposedly my boss, become VP of everything, the whole power dynamics changed. Everybody wanted to gravitate to him. And I did not realize the implication and the severity of this thing. It's positional power. So it was that either I fire Joe and a couple of other VPs, hire a new team, or I resign, and I took the latter. So there was some important lesson learned that you need to understand power and power base. And you need to compute ahead what would the implication of those decisions would be. 
this is when I decided to look for a new career and decided to take what I've learned so far and package that knowledge and start teaching. So I started teaching at, U at UC Berkeley at Haas Business School in 2005, after I was leaving uh, my last career. Then I ended up writing several books to package my knowledge because I got tired of answering the same question again and again. So I tell people, you know, just buy the book. And so they have been, a couple of them have been used as textbooks in different universities. But, uh, you know, anywhere from different aspect of starting a business that gives you a, a good set of concise knowledge, uh, what you need to know. And then uh, after three years, it took the three years to write the books, then I finally got back in the game and I co-founded this company with a couple of technical, uh, one technical founder. Ali and I came together. We did not know each other. A common friend brought us together. And that time, mobile security was hot. So we started this company in December of 2010. So in three years, we built this technology so employees can access corporate data from their mobile devices. Now it was a Silicon Valley-based company backed by Silicon Valley VCs. So I had no more commuting to Jerusalem or Austin. I handpicked every single team member. Actually, I brought the first five people I hired, but all the people known to me. Andy Smith had worked for me at uh, Veridicom. Indus Khaitan had, I was the chairman of his uh, startup when he was doing Tejit. Andy had worked with John Boyer. We all five people knew each other and got to know each other. The trust was there. We really worked hard. Our first customer, Chevron. Our second customer, ExxonMobil. Our third customer, EMC. So we were killing it. And then a little bit too soon, Oracle came and bought us. And uh, after three years later, then I finished. The, this is sort of the timeline how it went. Went from about 30 or 40 people, took only about $7 million, but got some really blue chip name customers, which got the attraction of some very large players. I still think we got sold too soon. If we had been allowed to live another two years, uh, things will be much better. But we all made some money, and it was good. You know, start from scratch. And then <clears throat> the journey sort of went from Honeywell to starting all these companies and working at them to Witzer. Now, I started this uh, Telesense, the IoT company. But lessons learned is that, you know, how, why do you get people to follow you? Why do the people come back? When I did Britzer Mobile, I got these five people to come follow me. Why? And fact is that if you were... If you were passionate, you were interested in them, you were genuine, people will follow you. You always have to know where your people are trying to go and do at least one thing to take care of them. If you don't know where your people who work for you, where are they trying to go in life, you're not being a good manager. Just by asking that question and knowing that, you earn their trust and you earn their loyalty. And remember, you have to be curious, you have to be learned. There's things are changing constantly all the time. One of the problems is if you get old, you stop learning. And that's why being at a university really, really helps because there's smart kids coming up with new ideas and bouncing off you every day. Second thing I learned was that entrepreneurship is freedom. I, used to, I lived for the first maybe 20 years of my life with this anxiety all the time that what will happen? What if I get fired? What if this happens? What if that happens? It was only maybe seven or eight years ago, maybe even five years ago, I realized they can kill me. You can throw me in Gobi Desert tomorrow. I have no doubt within 30 days, I'll be selling something to the locals. <laughs> because once you have that confidence that you, can, you know the method, you're invincible. That's freedom. And that freedom gives you a satisfaction which you cannot buy. So think about that. Entrepreneurship gives you the freedom, plus you get to the things you're passionate about. Because if you really love to play music and you become a musician, how hard it is to go to work. That's what you'd rather be doing. So I finally, I think the aim of my life was, by the time I turned 50, if I can align what I'm passionate about to what I do for a living, then I'm the happiest man alive. And I'm glad to say that I am there. Because when you stop chasing money, then something funny happens. Money chases you. So when you're starting chasing title, no good comes out of it. But it took me only 30 years to learn this lesson, so I'm sharing it with you. I know some of you won't even believe it because you're too young. 
So finally, somebody is, there is no school for this transition. You have to take your own lesson. But re talk to people who have gone through this, read some books, keep your own journal. And <clears throat> if you're investing in the people around you, and th when I started this company, for example, I just set up a, intentionally a low pre-money valuation. And I raised my last angel round of 800K, mostly from friends. I just picked a low valuation of 1.75 million pre. I could have picked five. I could have gone higher. But I wanted to be generous to friends and, and reward them for loyalty and say, come join me. Let's create something new. And, and I'm seeing the results of that. Because company is not the end game. There's a bigger end game in our lives. We need to realize what it is. Company is a mean to get to the end game. So all of us have to think through this. Once you have that clarity what the end game is, then you can make much wiser choices, which many people don't make. So if you want to get one of these books for free, this is the URL. You can download it for free. If, if not, it was great to see you all again. Thanks for coming and staying all the way through. Thank you very much. Thank you.